Paul Bloom live at Paisley for us tonight. In 2013, emergency responders came here to Paisley Park on a, a medical call. They transported a 53-year-old man suffering from dehydration to a nearby hospital. It's impossible to know whether that 53-year-old man was Prince, so the ages are close. In the end, these call logs are interesting, but don't seem to connect the dots to the mega superstar's death right here. That's popular Weber Park. There's a beautiful pool in that park, but now if you try to get from this neighborhood into that park, you're gonna run into this, about 10 feet of chain link fence. Still remains a very tense scene, a virtual standoff between demonstrators on one side and police on the other. This fire is in a very specific building. There are firewalls, so we're talking the blaze just ravaging this one corner right behind me. 12 residents were inside at the time. I am told by the fire marshal that all 12 residents have made it out. Everybody right now accounted for. For the very first time, Kaya McMillan is sharing her story. This is a woman whose passion it is to care for and work with the most dangerous of the mentally ill. She signed up for the job, but she certainly didn't sign up for the horror that unfolded last July. Is this a long, lifelong permanent injury? Yeah. yeah I mean, I haven't... Um, I haven't been able to drive since that day, take care of my daughter, go back to school. Kaya McMillan it chokes back tears as doctors at the U of M Medical Center monitor her brain activity around the clock. It's just affected every single aspect of my life. I never, never imagined it being like this. It was nine months ago. Kaya was working as what's known as a security counselor, but the most volatile of the mentally ill at the state security hospital in St. Peter. She reports that a teen patient with a history of violence had gotten out of control. Kaya was part of a team trying to get the young man out into a courtyard to calm him down when he snapped. He came at me and punched me in the face and grabbed me by the hair and threw my head against the brick wall that was right there a couple of times and then kneed me in the back of the head and that's when I lost consciousness. Kaya, 25 and working on her master's in mental health counseling at the time, suffered a traumatic brain injury. Seizures followed. Doctors are now trying to get those under control with this hospital stay that could potentially last up to 10 days. From her bed, she is now anxiously following the debate over state funding for the treatment and care of the mentally ill. She's been told her vicious assault has inspired Governor Dayton to push for significant upgrades and additional workers on the St. Peter campus. More staff will help, more security will help. It's, a, it's at least a starting point, but I mean, more training, more logical training. As for her future, Kaya has no idea what comes next. Even if I end up being okay physically, mentally, I don't know if I can ever go back and do what I've been working for, working towards my entire life. So I don't know if I'm gonna be able to provide the life that my daughter deserves. It's changed everything. Well, Kaya has not been able to return to work or school since the attack, and she needs help from her family caring for her precious four-year-old daughter. She tells me she still has so many nightmares about what happened. She actually takes medication to help her sleep peacefully. Paul Bloom, Fox 9. Fox 9's Paul Bloom following this investigation for us. And Paul, we learned yesterday that this couple did have a history of domestic problems. Kelsey, we know Luba Savinok had sought all kinds of help in this troubled relationship. She talked about it with her parents and family, her husband's parents and family. She took it to her church. She took out a protective order against her husband. But in the end, nothing was enough to save her own life or the life of her unborn son. The problem is this is one of the most underreported crimes there is. Had it been County Attorney Arthur. Mike Freeman charging Yevgeny or Eugene Savinok with two counts of first degree premeditated murder, going on the offensive when it comes to violence in the home. My father, a former Marine Corps colonel, told me when I was a 10 year old boy, you don't hit a woman. You know, I never forgot that. And that's good practice for everybody. Court documents detail a horrific attack Saturday morning with Eugene storming into the Eden Prairie house he shared with his pregnant wife, Luba, and their two young children, taking a kitchen knife and stabbing Luba over and over again before fleeing with the kids. According to court records, Eugene Savinok had a history of beating his wife. In fact, Luba had an active protective order against her husband when she was killed, an order she had accused him of violating in the past, a trial on those allegations scheduled for next week. At some point, Luba allowed Eugene to move back in, her extended family and loved ones shattered 
by the viciousness of the attack. When things got rocky, she would come back here to Chaska to her parents. She felt safe there. As for Eugene Savinok, he is in jail tonight. His bail set at a whopping $5 million. He is scheduled to make his first court appearance tomorrow. We're live in Eden Prairie. Paul Blim, Fox 9. The family really describes this as a double tragedy. Of course, the anguish of losing a loved one, a 24-year-old young man, just four and a half months ago, and now today, another heartbreaking blow for them. I can't see him pressing charges against his little police officers. I mean, I guess it's the first time for everything. Wilma Clark just had a gut feeling. She so wanted someone to blame for the death of the young man she helped raise. She so wanted to see the two Minneapolis police officers charged with murder. They need to pay and be accountable for what they did, like everybody else. They shouldn't be no different just because they're police officers. They just, just killed my son for no reason. James and Wilma Clark raised Jamar since the age of four. Foster parents, Jamar took their last name. On Wednesday morning, we watched on a community TV in their north side apartment building as the Hennepin County attorney crushed their spirits. Because it just, my heart just sank, end quote. Oh, please. Ringenberg believed he was going to die. The couple remains skeptical of the official case details laid out by Mike Freeman. They believe there's absolutely no way Jamar said he wanted to die that November night. I don't believe that for a minute. The Clarks also want to know why no other witnesses corroborated Jamar's so-called death wish and why lethal force was necessary. Isn't that what witnesses are for, you know, to, to tell what they saw? They ain't going by none of that thing. Only thing they're going by is what the police officers are, are saying, you know. They got out of it. I don't know how they live with themselves. Take somebody's life. This is a very devastating blow to the family. It's actually a terrible tragedy that has happened to my nephew. But I'm going to continue to pray for justice. All of us can relate to it. You know, you're running a few minutes late to work. You're on the Bluetooth. Someone cuts you off. This woman insists all she did then was honk her horn at that vehicle that cut her off in the heart of Minneapolis in the heart of rush hour. Tonight, she is home, grateful to be alive, with a bullet lodged just three inches from her heart. It's really hard because all I did was, all I did was honk my horn, and he tried to kill me. Upset, angry, scared. Kat asks us not to use her full name or show her face. She's just too afraid that the men who shot her will try to track her down. And I really hope they catch these guys that did it because I can't sleep at night. What we can show you, though, are the bandages and the bullet holes. One tore through her stomach and is difficult to look at. Kat was shot a total of four times. This was her car following the near-deadly road rage incident. The way Kat tells the story, she was heading to work down busy Hennepin Avenue. She'd missed her turn and honked at the Jeep Grand Cherokee that cut in front of her. Traffic cameras snapped several images of the suspect vehicle, described by some as beige, tan, or gold. Cat vividly remembers three people inside. I did see a black handgun before he shot me. Um, he had uh, short dreads, um, light skin, skinny. The shooter was sitting in the front passenger seat. Before opening fire, Cat recalls him rolling down his window and demanding that she pull over. Five seconds later, you know, I heard pop, 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 pop. After the shooting, Cat was rushed to the emergency room at 8 CMC. She spent two nights here and was sent home with a couple of the bullets still lodged in her body. I have two bullets in me. I have one in my arm and my bicep, and then I have one in my shoulder, three inches from my heart. Just three inches. Kat knows she is so lucky to have survived. She just can't believe she was almost killed because she apparently did something as simple as honking her horn. We all honk. We all like, you know, somebody cuts in front of us, we honk a horn. Tonight, MPD asking for the public's help. Kat absolutely believes someone out there knows who pulled the trigger. Reporting from the newsroom, Paul Blim, Fox 9.